before I get into the lesson, when Ken held this pencil sharpener up, it reminded me of something that some may know about and may not. And I think it's pretty true of our federal government and lots of things, or government in general. But when they were trying to figure out things years ago about how in weightlessness of space that they could find some sort of writing implement, and they couldn't use a standard uh, ballpoint pen that wouldn't work. So they spent over a million dollars to come up with a pen that would do that. The Russians just took a pencil. There's no problem. Sometimes we can be so smart, <laughs> so determined to have the best and think through it all. We miss the obvious. And that can be true of so many things. I don't know how many of you realize it, and I'm sure you understood the songs we've just sung. But they all had to do with Jesus taking care of us. Did you notice that? God taking care of his own in this life and then in eternal life in heaven. And uh, really I'm dealing with that this afternoon from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. I'll remind you again that Peter is writing to members of the church. And in those days, far more danger to being a Christian and living all your days according to the will of heaven. But here's what he said to him, and it's still just as applicable today as it was then and will be to the end of time, regardless of the culture or nation or society we may live in. Verse 6, humble yourselves. Well, if he tells me to humble myself, that may mean I'm not humble and I need to, but it also tells me I can. So humble yourselves, therefore, the light of what he's been talking about, under the mighty hand of God. Well, that's figurative speech. It's meaning be under the power of God. Well, the power of God's the will of heaven. It's the New Testament. It's the teaching of Christ. It's the gospel system. But notice you do that, that he may exalt you in due time. The last song we sung is where the exalting will be done in that white city of eternal abode of the blessed, heaven itself. But then he returns immediately back to our living here and our daily ups and downs and routines, some of it very serious, some of it hurtful physically and some mentally, especially if you're persecuted because you serve God, because you teach the truth. The verse 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Oftentimes over the years, it seems maybe even more so now with secularism, material things dominating the minds of people and God's pretty much ruled out, spiritual things put on the back shelf. But you hear people say, well, you don't care about me. Or somebody doesn't care about me. And that could very well be the case. Somebody, even those that should, mother, daddy, son, or daughter, they don't care about you. We're not talking about what's right or wrong with that, except it's wrong. But we're talking about the fact that here is a word from God to the faithful child of God saying, He cares for you. He cares for you. And what does that mean to me? I'm to cast all my care upon Him because He cares for me. Notice that this uh, statement is in the midst of several imperatives. Now, when I say something's imperative, it's a must. It must be done. Notice, submit, be clothed, humble yourselves, be sober, be vigilant, resist. Obligations are on our part to keep the truth of God when it involves doing these things. But now here's what's interesting. In grammar, it's a participle, and it's not an imperative itself. 
this statement really is explaining what it means to humble yourselves under God's hand. And you get that. It's an explanation of how you humble yourselves under God's hand, how you submit to his will, how you have that submissive spirit to his will. They are entrusting themselves to God and his system of salvation through Jesus Christ. And thus you find Peter saying in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you want to turn back over there, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, and we're familiar with this, he made reference to it this morning, who, when he was reviled, speaking of Christ, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Please keep in mind what we said about righteous and righteously this morning. So, what's the situation? Christ, in living what he, in the way he lived, being tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, who made the statement that my food is to do the Father's will, who said, I do always those things that please him. So he committed himself to God, and thus he's the example for you and for me as children of God, because God judges righteously. So I want us to look at that. When he was reviled, reviled all again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Let's look at the words in this verse. Remember, a word is a sign of an idea. A word is a vehicle of thought. God's thoughts travel to us through God's word. If you want to know what God's idea is on a matter, then you look for the word that reveals his thoughts, his ideas. Notice the word casting. Interesting word. We use that word a lot today when it comes to a casting rod, when it comes to fishing. I don't know whether you think about it much, but how often do you word, use the word casting? I really doubt it's that much. But he says casting. That's verse 7. Now, casting translates the Greek word epiripto. It means to throw upon or place upon. It is, what's interesting, it's an aorist verb in the Greek language. That is point action, one-time action. When you obey the gospel and all that is involved in obeying the gospel, what you must know in your mind, you're casting all your care upon him. You're entrusting your life to him. It's a once-for-all decision, punctuary action, but it has lifelong impact. And thus you can grow in that faith that allows greater trust on your part in God and his situation. Notice casting what? Care. And that's from a Greek word, Miriamna. Now, care can be used in a good way. We've seen it already. He cares for you. But care can be used in a bad way. The context will determine whether it's used in a good way or a bad way. And Miriamna means anxiety or worry over events or circumstances which one cannot control at all. It has nothing you can do about it to change it. It's going to be that way. How do Christians handle those things? I don't know of a one of us. Sometimes it's harder than other times according to the nearness of a person to you and the love you have for them. That usually involves family but you are willing to do all you can do to make another person's life better. 
But what happens? There's nothing you can do. Years and years ago, I wrote an article that says, when your hands are tied, tied, I run across that article the other day going through some stuff, when your hands are tied. My idea behind that was is that uh, we use that phrase sometimes to say, well, I can't do a thing about it. My hands are tied. Meaning the way we work is handicapped and we can't help help the situation. Through no fault of our own, not because we lack desire to help, nothing you can do about it. You can't repent of sins for another person. You can't obey the gospel for another person. You can do all you can to set the godly example, to be willing to teach them the truth, to build your mind up with the truth so you have the wherewithal to teach it. You can do all of those kind of things. You can pray about them, that they'll be receptive to the truth. But it's still up to them to want to know the truth, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to want to study, to desire to do what's necessary as taught in God's Word to go to heaven. Now this word in the etymology of it, we think probably came from a meaning that has to do with drawing different directions and thus to distract. Worry or anxiety distracts. You ever notice that? Somebody has talked to us and maybe they'll notice we're kind of, we're listening but we're not listening and maybe some say, what's bothering you? What's on your mind? Well, that's because something is on our mind. Could be a good thing. Could be something we can do something about. But many times, it's anxiety over what we know we can't do a thing to worry about. And it's a great thing in our faith when we reach a stage to where we can pray to our God according to the teachings of God on prayer about a matter we can do nothing about. And when we get through and say amen, we let it go. It is in the hands of providence now. It's in the hands of that person that must do what needs to be done for the good of that person. Now, there are things which would distract us from our God-given duty. Sometimes we think unless a person is a fornicator or an adulterer or something like that, well, that's not bad. But folks, fishing is a great thing. There's nothing wrong with itself in fishing. But if you fish so much you can't take care of the Lord's work, it's become a bad thing. It distracts you from what ought to come first in your life. That can be anything. Because you see, anything in this world that's fleshly, this material, it can, put, it can be put ahead of doing God's will. That's why we have to have such teaching is but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. Remember the sermon this morning? And all these things shall be added unto you. Now we're trying to understand what Peter's telling us here in God through Peter and other like passages when he tells us to cast all your care upon him for he careth for you. And this word careth then comes up. Mellow. Mellow. We would pronounce this like we'd say that fruit's mellow or something. Mellow. Uh, it signifies that something is an object of care, especially the care of forethought and interest, rather than this anxiousness or worry, taking thought about that which we can do nothing about. So you see here we see the words change, don't we? We have a care at times that's anxiety. The Lord's saying, cast that care upon Christ for He cares for you. Now it's interesting that in English you've got the same words, but, but He's saying there is a care that is sinful, there is a care that is not. Because Christ cares for us, he knows there are things we can't do a thing in the world about. Now what should we do about those things? Cast them on him. He knows how to handle it. He'll take care of it. Trust him to take care of it. You ever told somebody, trust me, I'll take care of it. I know what I'm doing. Well, assuming they really mean it and can, then that's fine. But the Lord's telling us that 
in every way possible usually and you see that gets into our faith doesn't it my trust in him that he will what he told me he would do he will do and this is said to Christians and so he will and we will remove from ourselves a great many things now there may be a struggle in our minds over the situation until we bring every thought into subjection to Christ but we can do it. Our Lord has not commanded us to do a thing we can't do. And whatever he's commanded us to do is for your good and my good. If he says cast every care upon him, and we understand what cast means and care, and the good care and the bad care, care and he cares for us, I, we can do it. And it'll work. It will work if our faith is what it ought to be in him. This word then implies that God has both the will and the ability to meet our needs. Now we do well at times to ask ourselves, do I believe my God through Christ and his whole system of salvation as presented in the New Testament will meet my needs? What good is it to sing the song we just sang about that pearly white city that John saw coming down. That says God cares for me. That when this life is over and done with, and God's faithful and resurrected bodies, he's prepared a place for us. Well, it's only going to be since faith comes by hearing the word of God that we can have faith in all of that because of the word and God telling us what to do. So God cares for us. We probably need that as much nowadays as we ever did. God verbally expresses this idea, this thought, throughout the whole of the Bible. I suggest sometimes when you're, when you're reading Psalms or some books like that, you notice how much that that thought is expressed concerning God's care for us. For example, Psalm 62, verses 6 and 7. Listen to the psalmist. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation, my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is God. Now, you can love your husband as much as any wife could love a husband, and the husband can love the wife as much as any husband could love the wife. Parents can love their children as much as any parents could, and vice versa. And you can love your brethren as much as you want to love them and ought to love them, as the Bible teaches we should love them. That only goes so far. As I've often said over the years in preaching, uh, there's been a many a person set by a sick bed as they dealt with a person with a terminal illness and they gave them all the help they could on this side of Jordan and they bathed their fevered brow and tried to offer words of encouragement, but there comes a point to where that ceases. But not so with the Lord's care for us. Everything in the Bible says he'll go right on with us. Psalm 142, verses 4 and 5, the psalmist says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. And he is for every faithful member of the church. Jesus taught on prayer. And in teaching on prayer, he taught us to pray in Matthew 6, verse 11, 11 Give us this day our daily bread. And think of the whole model prayer, and you'll see how much it reveals he cares for you. And every time we read of the love of God toward man, you see it manifesting his care for us. But greater yet than his verbal expressions 
is that God demonstrated his care. Go all the way back to the beginning when he created Adam and Eve sinless. Put them on the earth, but not just on the earth. He created a garden, especially for those two sinless people. And he placed Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden to take care of all their needs. You ever see anything, though the account is brief, that Adam and Eve worried about a thing in the world they were going to eat? It's all there. Anxiety and worry probably brings on us all kinds of problems. But we come on down and we see God building up the nation of Israel and how he chose to do it. And he delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. As we go on, we see even uh, Israel apostatizing all that God did to try to keep them from it. God, before there were kings, sent judges to deliver them and so on and so forth. He cared for them all the time. And all the time they were rebelling against him. All the time they were sinning against him. All the time they were rejecting the prophets. Just read Stephen's sermon where he asked, which of the prophets said to your ancestors, your fathers, not stone? And of course then the ultimate sacrifice was the giving of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. John 3 verse 16. And Paul put it this way to the church at Rome in Romans 5, 8 through 10. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then he says, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. He goes on to say, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's assurance that if we will take care of our business of faithful adherence to his word, dressed in the righteousness of the gospel system, we'll be saved by his life. In other words, as surely as Christ lives, so shall his spiritual body when every member is faithful. Thus, we cast our cares upon him. And these are cares which, as we said earlier about this word, means things such as anxious matters we do nothing about, that we worry about, and they distract us from faithful service to God. Again, back to the Old Testament, to the Psalms. Psalm 55 and verse 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And what did we study about righteousness this morning? And who is righteous? Well, he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Then Paul wrote in the Philippian epistle, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, Be careful for nothing. Well, now you see careful is back being used, anxious and worried. Don't be careful for anything. Don't worry about all these things. Don't be distracted. You can't do anything about it anyway. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. What's going to happen when you in full faith, faith comes by hearing the word of God, follow the teaching of God on these matters? Well, he tells you. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why, the system's set up, folks. God cares for us. It's just up to us to trust him on the basis of his word and understand how he lifts every burden and every care from us. Now, all these cares can be of different nature, family cares, business cares, personal cares, cares for your friends and others, cares for the church. Paul even referred one time when he was summing up all things that happened to him, there was terrible persecution for Christ, said, and that which cometh home me daily, 
the care of all the churches. Then we can accept whatever may come. That's the only way you're going to be able to accept it is by following the plans God set out. We talk about the plan of salvation. It's wonderful. That's becoming a Christian. You hear the gospel, you understand it, you see the evidence in it that Christ is the Son of God. Your trust is built in Him. You take Him at His word. You obey Him in repenting of your sins and confessing your faith in Him. And you're baptized into Jesus Christ. Well, brethren, we're talking about the plan of salvation pertaining to Christian living. It's as much a plan of salvation as the rest of it once you get into Christ. Through prayer, we can give every care to God. Thus, we need to learn how to pray. We need to pray and not worry. In Jeremiah 7 in verse, or 17 in verse 7, listen to what the great prophet said. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. And you come over to the New Testament in chapter 4 of the book of Philippians, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing. American Sanders says, In nothing be anxious, but in everything. What's left out? We read it earlier. Everything by prayer and supplication, pouring out your heart to God with thanksgiving, always being thankful. Let your request be made known unto God. You know, God's saying, I want to know. I want to know what's on your mind. What's troubling you? And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. God looks on every one of his faithful children for good. 1 Peter 3, 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And we've all used this verse, or at least I think we have. Romans 8, 28, and we, know, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are called according to His purpose. Those, those who are called according to His purpose are the righteous. They've heard the righteous message of the gospel, and they've clothed themselves in it by humbling themselves under the mighty hand of God and obeying it. And God says, I'll take care of you. And the proof of that really is, is, is sometimes escapes us. We tend to apply that to saying, if I love the Lord, keep his commandments, he'll be with me and everything will work all right. The force of this is far beyond that. Down through the centuries with all that man did that was bad and good and all that stuff, God still worked everything right out, right on down through people like Pharaoh and Ahab and all those people. And in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. That's what's really being said there. That's the reason I know God's in control of everything. Now, nothing that happened in this world stopped God from working everything out for good as he brought down to the time of the Christ, all that Christ did. And even when the Jews thought the devil did too, we're getting rid of him, we've got him killed on the cross, it all worked into God's great plan of just how he would save man from his sins. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, the admonition of the inspired writer to those to get them to repent and make sure they stayed faithful. Let your conversation be without covetousness, your manner of life, your conduct. And here's such a great thing. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake thee. So that we, the church, may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Think of the three Hebrew children when they're told, You're going to bow down before this idol at the proper time, or we're going to throw you in this fire furnace. You ever noted the calmness of those three men? Now, whether you let us go or not, or whether God delivers us or not, 
what they're saying is we know the mind of God on the matter. We're not going to bow down to this idol. And there written four times for our learning is the fact, though a miracle was worked then, they threw them in the furnace, making it seven times hotter, and even killed the people who threw them in. But Nebuchadnezzar looks down that fire. He says, did we not throw three men in the fire? And they're walking around down there, and there's a fourth down there like to the Son of Man. Well, that doesn't mean we're going to have that happen to us today. But well, what's it teaching? What's the message? What's the lesson for us to learn? Well, it's right where we started off. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Thus we trust him in all circumstances and situations based upon his word. Psalm 62, 8 reads, Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Another psalm, Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. He might avert the fear or support us through it. I don't know which one he'll choose. I just know he'll choose the best for me under the circumstances, situations of the time as I'm laboring to follow the truth. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 reads, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. problem with us sometimes is that we stop looking for the place of escape through the eye of faith, which means by the word of God. We give in. We don't have faith. But it's there. There's always a way of escape. So we can bear it. Then Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, this is what I was referring to earlier. We're troubled on every side. And yet not distressed. We are perplexed. But not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. When you walk out in the world, you're around your work mates and your school chums and whatever, and they're living all manner of kinds of ungodly lives, maybe even in your family. You have a consolation, as the Lord said, I have meat that you know not of, that they don't understand. And as the whole world bubbles on its way to torment at the end of time, you rest assured because of the righteousness of God given us of the gospel and our submitting under the great mind of God, power of God, by obedience to the truth, you have strength that nobody knows. So this whole thing is designed to cause us to pick up and carry on. God is with us every step of the way. And what a wonderful and encouraging thought that God cares for me. Thus I can cast my anxieties upon him. But only, only if I'm a faithful servant of his. If you need to obey the gospel today, we urge you to please do so, to love the truth, because it's God's truth. It's given to us for our good because he cares for us. To repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, what is your faith in God about things of this life and getting through life as a righteous person? Well, know this, God stands waiting if we will take him at his word. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.